We'll be in the book of Ephesus or Ephesians for a few months, three months. So if you count, this will carry us till next year. The book of Ephesus or Ephesians, it's a letter by St. Paul to Christians, and it's about the church. It's about us. It's about you and me. It's about the church. Normally, when, when Paul writes a letter, he writes to address a specific issues that happens in that church or to Christians, the struggle that Christians are experiencing. Uh, Ephesians is different. Ephesians is more general in that sense. He's not addressing as particular issues that Christians are experiencing in Ephesus. He talks about uh, a, a general thing about church, who they are as a church of Christ. So it's about who the church is, about who they are, and how they can be the church. So in, in a way, as we look at the book, we learn how we can be the church, who we are as a church in Christ, according to the scripture, not how we or the world define church. That's why when we don't come together in a physical sense, in lockdown, we still, in a sense, a church that belongs to Jesus Christ. And in these three months, we're going to look at how we can be the church and who we are as a church. So this morning, we're going to look at Ephesians 1 as an introduction. Uh, Ephesians 1, 1 to 10. This will set the course for the next three months. If you look at the Bible, however, if you have your Bible before you, a uh, physical one it will be easier than, than a digital one. If you look at verse 3 onwards, from 3 to 14, it's actually a section. And in, in Greek, verse 3 to 14 is actually one long sentence. It's a very long one, and we're going to split it till next week. We're going to talk about it more next week. And so what can we learn today is what we're going to look at. What, what can you learn in, in this introduction, in the opening of, of this amazing letter by Paul? So Paul wants to know, want the church to know, want you and I to know, want Christians Ephesus to know who they are in this introduction before he tells them anything else about what they need to do, what does it mean to be a church. In the introduction, Paul wants to tell them who you are. Because that's important. Before you do all these things that call church ministry, busy about doing church stuff, we need to know who we are as a church, who we are as a Christian. And that's what Paul gets into in this introduction. So we're going to look at the who, and the what, and the how. Okay? The who is who are you. The what is what do you have. And the how is how do you have it? So who are you and what do you have and how do you have it? The first one, who are you? Ephesians 1 verse 1. It says this, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, to the saints who are in Ephesus and are faithful in Christ Jesus. Paul says this letter is written by him, an apostle of Christ Jesus, in Christ Jesus, by the will of Christ Jesus, to, and he's writing it to, the saints in Ephesus. The question is, who are the saints? What are the saints? What is this thing called saints? Um, oftentimes, we may think that saints are special kind of Christians. Um, Christians who have been baptized, perhaps, are called saints. Or Christians who read the Bible. They're, it might be a shock to you, but they're Christians who don't read their Bible. Um, so we think saints are those who actually read their Bible, saints who are faithful and obedient to what they read or what they heard in church, uh, Christians who don't sin or seldom sin. Those are some of the pictures that we have when we hear saints because we tag saints in front of the Paul, for example, St. Paul, St. James, St. Peter, or these are the great 
men and women of God, they are called saints, but I am not one. But that's not saints, the word saints, what the word saints mean in the Bible or how the Apostle Paul used it. Uh, saints simply mean, in, in, in Paul's language here, are uh, Christian who are, have been set apart for Christ. So if you're a Christian today, you are saints. This letter is for you. So saint simply means those who have been set apart. Set apart for God and set apart in Jesus, in God. Now, this is what Paul wants the church to understand before he goes any further in his letter, is that who they are, who are these people, who are you? You are saints. You have been set apart by God and for God and in God. So before you read what James says, or not what Paul says you ought to do as a Christian, he said, know who you are. You are saints. You have been set apart by God for Him in His Son, Jesus. So let me say this then. Let me say maybe something that you may not have thought before, but Christianity or to be a Christian is not a process. It's not a process. To be a Christian is, is not something that you prepare yourself to be, that you work towards. And some of you are in the process of getting baptized. That is different to getting prepared to become a Christian because God set you apart. You don't, you don't prepare yourself, in a sense, to become a Christian so Christianity is not a process that you become into, that you work towards. It's not. Um, it's not what you do that makes you a Christian, you see. You don't try to be a Christian. Christianity is not something that you try to be. It's not. Um, either you are or you are not. So when somebody asks you, are you a Christian? You say, well, I'm trying to be. Then you don't know what Christianity is because either you are a Christian or you're not. Because Christianity is not something you work for or you work towards. To be a Christian, is some, it's something that happens to you. And in the word saints, it means that God has set you apart. That's what it means. To be Christian means to have been set apart by God for His glory in His Son, Jesus. So that's what he say in verse 1 to the saints who are in Ephesus. In verse 2, he says this. Uh, Christians in Ephesus, Paul says, you are saints. How? How they are saints? And he gives us an explanation in verse 2. He says, because they are in Christ Jesus. You are saints, you are set apart because you are in Jesus. In verse 3, he says, Paul informs them, um, the Christians, of their blessings for being a Christian in Christ Jesus. Do you see the pattern? He said, you are saints because you are in Christ Jesus, and you have blessings, in verse 3, in Christ Jesus. And verse 4 and 5, Paul explains to them of one of these blessings, their adoption as sons. How? In Him. In Jesus, you have your adoption as sons. In verse 6, he talks about their redemption. That their redemption is found in him, in Christ Jesus. If, if you keep on reading, if you, this is why physical Bible is great. If you keep looking at it and you have a pen or a pencil or a highlighter, you can start marking when when. When Paul says, in Christ, in Him, in Christ Jesus, until verse 14, remember? 3 to 14, they're actually one long sentence. He just keeps saying, in Christ Jesus, in Him, in Jesus. He's reminding the saints, he's reminding Christians, you and I, why we are saints, who we are. We are in Christ Jesus. That's what makes us 
special. Not because of what we do, not because what we have achieved this morning. You know, for some of us, it's quite a huge achievement that we can get here in this building after months at home. You know, church is basically switching on a computer. But we are not special because of what we've done, but because of who we are in Christ Jesus. That's what Paul wants Christians in Ephesus to understand and to know. I'm not saying to be a Christian requires no obedience. It's quite different, okay? I'm not saying that. And, and if you read the Bible, there's a lot of things that requires our obedience. But our obedience doesn't make us Christians. You must understand this. We must obey as a Christian, but our obedience doesn't make us Christian. Obedience doesn't define or identity. So my children, for example, will always be my children, whether they obey me or disobey me. Um, with the ages of my kids, obedience is up and down. But they will always be my kids. It's their identity. They are, they are not more son or daughter of mine when they obey me than when they disobey me, you see? Their status doesn't change. They don't become suddenly more son or more daughter one day and then less son and less daughter the next day. It doesn't work that way. But does it mean that then children shouldn't obey their parents? Absolutely not, right? Obedience is important, yet that does not define who they are as son and daughter. Now, church, let me say that again. You are either a Christian or you are not, okay? Uh, you can learn to walk in obedience, but you cannot try to be a Christian. You are a Christian who are trying to walk in obedience. You don't try to be a Christian. You just try to walk in obedience, but you are a Christian. Now, if you're married, you are married. You don't try to be married. Uh, you try to be a good spouse, perhaps, to be a good husband, to be a, to be a good wife. What you do as a husband or as a wife doesn't change your status. It doesn't. You're married. You're married. Regardless of what you do, whether you're a bad spouse or not, you're married. That's your status. So Christian, who are you? Paul says, you are Christians. You have been set apart. You are saints, set apart by God. That's who you are. And nothing in this world, nothing in this world, even when you fail God, even when you quarrel on your way to church, even when you disappoint God again and again, that doesn't change who you are in Christ Jesus. You are saints, set apart by God for His glory in His Son, Jesus. Nothing in this world can change your identity as the son of the most high God. You will always be precious in his eyes. Even, even to the minute that you step into this, just before you step into this building, you have crazy, sinful thought in your head. To God, you are precious. That's who you are. Now, Paul says this in verse 5, that, Christ has, God has predestined us for adoption to himself. He made sure that happened. He predestined us. He planned that to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. I just want to mention a little bit quickly on this one because some people think that Christianity is a outdated sexist belief uh, that puts women down because you just they say look just look here god predestined us everyone for adoptions to himself as sons he said you know there's disregard of women well to be honest if you read carefully and know your bible this is actually proved the point that christianity respect women more so than people in those culture 
Because in those culture, in Jesus' time, in Romans' time, women will not inherit from their parents. They will not inherit from their parents. And what Paul says here is, regardless of whether you are man or woman, God adopts you as sons who will inherit the kingdom. Not only the sons who are special, but men and women. If you've been set apart by God, you will inherit. And in fact, um, Romans 8.17 says that we are heirs of God, co-heir, fellow heir, with Jesus. We share the same inheritance as Jesus, the Son of God, the Son of God, you and I, who just perhaps sin before we come to church this morning. So Paul wants us to understand and get this before we, we go any further for the next three months, that you have been set apart, that you are special in God's eyes, regardless of what you've done, all your past failures, whether recently or five years ago or 20 years ago, that doesn't make you any less Christian. That doesn't make you any less saints in God's eyes. So that's who you are. You are sons of the Most High God. So what do you have as the sons, right? You want to ask, what do I inherit? What's so, so, so special about being Christians to be saints? to be set apart by God, what do I have? That's what we're going to look at next. I'm glad you asked that question because that's in my notes. Um, what do you have as sins, as sons of God? Well, we, we actually have seen some of this quickly uh, as we go through the in Him, in Christ Jesus. Those are some of the blessings that we have. Um, the key here, again, we have this in Christ Jesus. We have as sons of God, through Christ Jesus. That's, that's how we have this. But what do we have? We, we've seen some of the blessing, and that's all great, but there's actually even better than just nice blessing. If you look at verse 3, what do you see? What kind of blessing do you have? It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, pay attention to this, who has blessed us in Christ Jesus with what? With every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. Not with some. Uh, you are more sins than others. You, you have ten blessings. You are you're not such a good kid. You, you get five. Paul says, you have every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus through him. Every. How many? Every. All of them. A person who, who just be, became a Christian a minute ago, or even as you listen just now, suddenly God changed your heart perhaps, and at that moment you become Christian, God says you have every blessing. Just as some of you who've been, who been Christian for 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. It's the same. On the cross when Jesus died, there's a thief who said, remember me. And Jesus said, you will be in heaven with me, in paradise with me. That moment, every spiritual blessing so we, I don't want you to miss this, that our spiritual blessings come, or we have access to this, in Christ. Okay? Not apart from Christ, in Christ. Um, how, how is this possible, you may ask? How can a person who just become a Christian a minute ago have every spiritual blessing? How is it possible when you've been Christian 20 years and you still trying and working hard to obey God and to receive God's blessing in your life. How is that possible? Well, the key is in Christ. Not in your own strength, not in your own ability to obey, but in Christ. Uh, let me explain by illustration of, um, because I'm, I'm sure most of us, if not all of us, would know Prince Harry and his wife. 
Meghan Markle. So Prince Harry married Meghan, a Hollywood star, a commoner, not a royal. So when C got married, when C became uh, Harry's wife, at that moment, she had every blessing that belonged to Harry. All that belongs to Harry is hers, and all that is hers, whether debts or anything, you know, she might owe people money, that becomes Harry's debt to pay. That's what marriage does. At that very moment, has Megan at that moment when they say when they say to one another, "I do," has physical access to Harry's bank account? No. But she has every blessing, in a sense that she has access through Harry. Just like we have every spiritual blessing, the moment we become Christian, in. Christ Jesus. Of course, uh, when, when she got married, even have kids, and um, she, she can still behave like a commoner, not right, like a royal, just like another Hollywood star. She can still do that. She could still try to earn her, her way to be, to be a wife of, of a prince, in a way, in a sense, to prove her worth. She can do that, but she doesn't have to, but she can. And a lot of people do that way. A lot of Christians do that way. You remember your past? Not, not everyone have a, have a good and clean past. When you reflect on your past, you haven't been a, a good person. And when you become Christian, you keep trying to prove yourself to be a saint, to be a Christian. You say, I want to prove my worth that I'm now a good person. We do that. We can live that way, but that's not what God wants us to live our life. He said the moment you become Christian, the moment you've been set apart, you have access to every spiritual blessing. So live like one. You are now sons of the Most High God, the King of Kings. Behave like one. Speak like one. But instead, many Christians, depending on your past, when they become Christian, they still live like an orphan, not like a son of the Most High God. So Paul says here that all we have is in Christ, and what we have is every spiritual blessing. He's trying to remind us that we have, you and I, have nothing to prove to God. Nothing to prove to God. Our obedience is not to prove to Him that we love Him. That's not why we obey Him. That's not why we come and serve Him. That's not why we love one another. It's not to prove to Him that we love God. Our obedience is the result of our love for Him because He loved us. So as Christians, we don't, we don't have just some blessings. Uh, we have every spiritual blessing now, some of them, though, we, we, we have access to them. Some others, we're still working uh, them through in our lives. Okay? But we have every spiritual blessing. So one, <clears throat> let me just, maybe throughout these couple, next couple of weeks, as we look at this opening verse, opening chapter, we, we're going to look at more on some of this. But let me just quickly go through some of the blessing in terms of category, some of um, the aspects of this blessing, if you look, look at this. The first one, there's four aspects of our blessing, the past blessing, the present blessing, the future blessing, and the forever blessing. So the past blessing is in verse 4 and 5, it says our election. In verse 4, our election, we are chosen before the foundation of the world. That's our past blessing. In verse 5, our past blessing, another past blessing is our adoption through Christ. It's been predestined, predetermined by God. 
And our present blessing in verse 7 and 8, he says, our redemption and forgiveness in Jesus through his blood. The regular ongoing forgiveness of our sin that happens through our life in this present time. Um, we, we have that access today. As, as you know, we, we, don't, we no longer have to slaughter an animal and offer a burnt offering for the forgiveness of our sin. We have access to that every day, every moment in Christ Jesus. That's our present blessing. And our future blessing in verse 9, 10, and 11, it says our restoration, our future inheritance. We have a foretaste of that inheritance right now, the blessing that we have right now, but that is nothing compared to what we're going to get in future. So we have a foretaste of that, but there's nothing Nothing. When the, the Bible talks about this moment when, when we meet Jesus, that all our past pain and suffering that we are going through, we forget about it. So there's a future restoration. This is good news. This is good blessing, right? As, as, especially if you get older, uh, your body starts to get weakened, falling apart, Right? Uh, they say that as you get older, the first thing that goes away is your eyesight. And I start feeling that now. You know, as I look at my Bible, I, I try my best not to wear my glasses, but it gets blurry by the week, you know. Eyesight's the first to go, they say. Our future blessing is restoration. You can throw away your contact lenses. Not now. <laughs> In future, there'll be restoration. And man, you know, let me tell you, as your f- hair is falling off, there will be glorious restoration. Everything will be restored. That's our future blessing. This is just some of it. This is just some of it. Jesus speaks of going away to the Father, preparing a place for you and for me. He's preparing not just a dorm, <laughs> preparing a home for you each of you, cater to, your, to how God has designed you, to your own desires. Some of you like big spacious things and intricate stuff or paintings or music or whatever it is. Jesus said, I went away to prepare a place for you. And the last aspect of our blessing is our forever blessing that happens now in the past, from the beginning of the foundation of the world till the end, from Alpha and the Omega, from forever to forever, is mentioned in verse 11 and 12. You see, not everything will go on forever. Not everything will go on forever, but something will go on forever. And one thing that will go on forever is our worship of Him. So what we do in church as we lift our voices as we come together to worship Him, as we listen to His Word, this is worship. Our worship to Him will go on forever. The only, pro- the only, the only difference will be, right now we try to worship Him while we are still sinful beings. So sometimes we worship Him still with, with burden, with heavy heart, we still feel the, the heavy yoke, even getting up in the morning, coming to church. Some of us still have to argue with one another. No, I don't feel like church. I feel like church. But in future, that worship will just a delight, a complete delight. Now, some of us have, have a foretaste of that, what it means to have that delight of worship. You have this discipline of reading the Bible to the point that if you miss reading the Bible, you feel something is not quite right. And when you open your Bible and when you read your Bible, when you smell that beautiful page, mm, and with your pen and color pencils, you have that sense of delight of reading the Word of God. That's a foretaste. That's a shadow. That when in heaven, when, when we are with Jesus, that is a pure delight. Worship is no longer just something that you work hard towards and you push yourself towards. 
but it's a delight, a pure delight. So that's a forever thing, our worship. Finally, the third thing is, how do you know you have it? How do you know you have this amazing spiritual, every spiritual blessings, how do you know you have it? As a Christian, as I said, we could live like an orphan, not like sons. That means we don't have it in a sense. We don't live like we have it. So how do you know you have it? I've said before, to be a Christian is not a process. Remember? So either you're one or you're not, either you're a Christian or you're not. If you are, Paul says in point two is, you have every spiritual blessing. So how do you know that you have that every spiritual blessing in your life? How can Megan Markle stop living her life trying to prove her worth to her husband or to the world? that she's now a princess. Or, you know, she's, just, she's no longer just a, a, a movie star or a TV star. How? How can she do that? By believing in herself more? No, but that's how Christian does it, right? Believe yourself more. You are Christian. Just believe. It doesn't work that way. That's, that's what many Christians do, though, right? Um, when it comes to what they have in Christ Jesus, they say, you know, if you're not kind, if you don't have that blessing in your life, if, if you're still working towards being kind, right? You're still selfish. You still just, just keep doing it. Just fake it. Just pretend you're kind to people in front of your Christian brothers and sisters. Just pretend. Just fake it till you make it. That's not what the Bible teaches us. Fake it till we make it. So how do you know you have the blessing that you are accepted and forgiven in, in Christ Jesus through His blood, But for example? How do you know? On one level, yes, you need to believe it in your head. That's the first thing. Okay? You need to believe that. But if it stops there, stops in believing and just keep believing, uh, you you don't yet have it. Just believing that you know you, you are accepted and forgiven doesn't mean you have it. In fact, if it stops there, you don't have it yet. Let me explain. Because just by believing it, you only know it. You can hurt it, you have not experienced it. Pastor Ferdy says it, I heard it, I believe it. That's it. It stops there. It's still third. Um, it's still, uh, what do you call it? In a sense, like, you are still, even though you are active listening, but you have not been the person experiencing that truth. Have you been around someone who smokes? It feels like you're smoking as well, but you're not. This is why Satan's are happy for many Christians coming to church every Sunday. Because a lot of Christians coming on Sunday thinking that they are Christian, they're doing the right thing, they're, that's it, that's all they need to do. They understand it, they hear it, that's it. But if you don't believe it, if it stuck just in your head, it won't do you any good. And many Christians believe that. Unfortunately. So on one level, you bleed in your head. It stops in your head. Um, you heard about it, but you have not experienced it in your life, that you are adopted as sons, that you are forgiven. That's why you're still working towards being obedient. You still beat yourself up when you don't obey. When you fail, you still beat yourself up. You still have this sense of guilt in you. Because you know you have been forgiven in the head, but you have not experienced that forgiveness in your heart. You're still seeking that. You're still wanting to please God so that He loves you. You have not experienced His love. So don't live a life, a Christian life, as an orphan, trying to prove yourself. So this is a test, how you know you have it. Not only you know it, 
and believe it, but you find that truth, that blessing beautiful to you. You find it precious to you. You find it glorious to you. That's how you know you have it. Do you know you are a son of God? Do you just know it? Or do you find it beautiful? You find it glorious. You find it privileged. You find it amazing. Or is there some truth, some doctrine that you know? I'm adopted. When Jesus died on the cross, he died for me. It stuck here. That's it. Do I find it beautiful? Hmm, I don't know. It's a truth. It's a fact. It happened. The Bible says so. But has it changed you? Has it wowed you? Has it when you, when you listen that Jesus died for you on the cross to forgive your sins, has it affect your heart so much that it shed tears? That say, who am I? Forgiven? What have I done to deserve that? You have it when you find it glorious. So, do you find the forgiveness of Christ Jesus for your past sin, present sin, and future sin beautiful, or is this another doctrine or just another fact to believe in? When you find something to be beautiful and glorious, uh, there's one thing you can no longer do. Let me say that again. When, when, when you find something to be beautiful and glorious, there's one thing that you can no longer do. And that one thing is to stay quiet about it. You cannot shut up about it. Have you been around someone who just found a new hobby? Or has a new interest? Or a new girlfriend or boyfriend? They cannot do one thing. Shut up about it. Do you find the love of God glorious and beautiful? If you do, you cannot be quiet about it. Some of us, oh, no, 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 that's, that's private. That's, that's for me. That's for me. Come on. Who are you kidding? If you find a nice restaurant that is so cheap, that is so delicious, you cannot shut up about it. You tell your friends about it. And you tell me, Christ, God, Son of God, who died on sin for the forgiveness of your sin, you can be quiet about it? And you say you find it glorious and beautiful? I say, no. Paul said, no. The reason you don't have it because you just know it in your head, but you don't believe it in your heart. You have not experienced that forgiveness, that love of God in your life. Um, your hearts need to be moved. And there are many people who have been moved uh, even as they step in to, to church and, and know that what a privilege it is, what an honor it is. A sinner like them can come into a holy place where the holy God lives. Like, can you imagine your, I'm not talking about building, I'm talking about body. Christ says, Christian, God lives in you, the Holy Spirit lives in you. Even that, understanding that and believing that would, would like shock us to the core. And before you, you utter harsh words about someone, you'll be reminded like, Holy Spirit lives in me. I cannot defile this mouth. Or this heart. So what is Jesus' death on the cross to you? Is the question. Is it just another doctrine, another knowledge that you know? Regardless whether you, you believe it to be 100% true or not. Is it just an, another historical event that happened 2,000 years ago? Or something more personal? Uh, let me tell you, I, 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 I always do my walk um, every day. Uh, I try, except when it's, you know, like Melbourne, 
uh, weather, right? Uh, you were planning to go for a walk and suddenly the weather changed. It started hailing and stuff. I've been caught in hails more than, more than, more than my, my, t- my share of time in, in Sydney that I live a lot longer than I live in Melbourne. In Melbourne, three years, I, I caught up in the rain and storm as, as, when I walk out so many times I couldn't count. But during my walk, there's many, many times I tell you that I, I just embarrass a little bit as I, you know, I, I want to avoid people because I, as I suddenly got speak to me in a way that is so personal that I just couldn't help myself, I'd cry. As I walk, not doing anything. And that's God's grace. Like I don't deserve Him to touch me as I'm doing my afternoon walk. But He did. And God does that to every one of us in His own ways more than you would believe. In the little things. Jesus did not just die on the cross for anyone. No, He did not. Jesus died on the cross for you. If there's only one person, and that one person is you, He would do the same for you. It's a personal thing. God is a personal God. So how do you know you have it when, you, when it becomes glorious personally to you, not just another fact? That's why there's no point of keep reading your Bible if, if your goal is to just fill up your head with knowledge so that you can debate with someone else, so that you can debate with your colleagues who don't believe in Jesus. As you open the Word of God, as you come to church, as you pray to God, pray that God will touch your heart, that He will speak to you in person, personally. When God, I can say the same words, but different people will get different things this morning. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is at work. Holy Spirit is talking to each and every one of you right now as the Word of God being delivered to you. As you hear, as you, your mind computes, God is working in your heart at this very moment. It's a personal thing. So every spiritual blessing, every spiritual blessing is available in Christ Jesus through His blood. Not through your work, not through your effort. You are sons, not because you try to obey to be sons, to behave and dress like sons. No, you are sons because of the blood of Christ on the cross. The agony on that rugged cross made you a fellow heir with Jesus in the kingdom of God. It was a gift. That was a gift, not something that you earn. It's something that you receive freely. So let me close by asking two questions. The first one, has this truth of what Christ has done for you, has this truth began to sink in for you yet from here to here the greatest distance of travel not from here to Mars not from here to Pluto not from here to the age of the universe no the longest distance is here to here has it sunk in yet for you from here to here that Jesus died for you has what Jesus did for you become beautiful and glorious Let us close.